Um, good evening. Uh, this is James Hal. Let's uh, start it. Let me uh, first of all let me introduce you our um, speaker, the special speaker for the um, the New House Advertising Speaker Series. Um, before doing this, I mean, I was thinking about asking my colleagues, uh, Professor Russell and Professor O'Neill, to. Um, before doing this, I mean, I was thinking about asking my colleagues, uh, Professor Russell and Professor O'Neill, to introduce her, but uh, none of them like to do that because they're afraid of being um, sued. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> O'Neill to introduce her, but uh, none of them like to do that because they're afraid of being um, sued. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> um, so we need, let me um, let me read the, uh, the bio. Um, Mary Neil Cummings sued. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> um, so we need, let me um, let me read the, uh, the bio. Um, Mary Neil Cummings is our speaker today. She's an attorney who specializes in the development and protection of brands and their claims. The bio. Um, Mary Neil Cummings is our speaker today. She's an attorney who specializes in the development and protection of brands and their claims. As former assistant general counsel for a Glasso. Uh, Smith Klein. She guided Tom's, Aquafish, and uh, Nicoret, LI, and other brands to success in advertising litigation. Uh, Smith Klein. She guided Tom's, Aquafish, and uh, Nicoret, LI, and other brands to success in advertising litigation. Provided counsel on FDA and FTC matters, PR strategies, social media brands to success in advertising litigation. Provided counsel on FDA and FTC matters. PR strategies, social media, privacy, claim support, clinical design, and competitive issues. So you can see that. I mean, she has a lot of PR strategies, social media, privacy, claim support, clinical design, and competitive issues. So you can see that. I mean, she has a lot of credentials. Prior to joining uh, Glasgow Smith Klein in 1999, Cummings was a litigator with the national law firm K and L Gates, previously Kirkpatrick and Lockhart. In 1999, Cummings was a litigator with the national law firm K and L Gates, previously Kirkpatrick and Lockhart. In 2010, she moved to Central New York, where she is developing a marketing and regulatory law with Kirkpatrick and Lockhart. In 2010. She moved to Central New York, where she is developing a marketing and regulatory law and public interest practice. Um, just so you know, that our, the, uh, this particular session with marketing and regulatory law and public interest practice. Um, just so you know, that our, the, uh, this particular session we start I mean, 6:10, so we have to end this 7:10 uh, because there's another another session right after this. So the schedule is a little bit awkward. So some people might be late. So we'll start it right away in this case. So let's get another another session right after this. So the schedule is a little bit awkward. So some people might be late. So we'll start it right away in this case. So let's give a round a round of applause to welcome Mary Kong and Mary Nail Kong. Started right away in this case. So let's give a round, a round of applause to welcome Mary Kahn. Can you marry Neil Kahn? Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having me, Professor. I um, am thrilled to be here. Uh, mostly because I made it. I was. Sir, I um, am thrilled to be here. Uh, mostly because I made it. I was um, flying on Sunday from South Carolina, which is a 14 hour car ride. It was a 15 hour plane ride. Um, but it's always fun to spend. Which is a 14 hour car ride. It was a 15 hour plane ride. Um, but it's always fun to spend time in airports, and I didn't mind at all. OK. Um, before I start, I, I just want to, um, I feel it's important that I, I, I say this. OK. Um, before I start, I, I just want to, um, I feel it's important that I, I, I say this. I'm sure I'm the only person that cares about it. But I did work for 10 years for GlaxoSmithKline. That I, I, I say this, I'm sure I'm the only person that cares about it, but I did work for 10 years for GlaxoSmithKline, which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies um, in the world, and for GlaxoSmithKline, 
which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies um, in the world. And I um, prepared the topic and the contents of this speech in the world. And I um, prepared the topic and the contents of this speech completely from recent information studies and the contents of this speech completely from recent information studies, papers, and none of this reflects any information that I learned um, from my client or that is confidential in any way to my client. And I, I just want to make that disclosure before um, from my client or that is confidential in any way to my client. And I, I just want to make that disclosure before I start. Okay. So we're here to talk about, I, I just want to make that disclosure before I start. Okay. So we're here to talk about marketing and social media. Now, if you're Toyo, oh, we're here to talk about marketing and social media. Now, if you're Toyota or Doritos or Verizon Wireless, marketing and social media can be fun. If you're a drug company, marketing and social media marketing and social media can be fun. If you're a drug company, marketing and social media can be deadly. It is a very, very difficult task. Um, there are lots of risks. It's highly regulated and um, very, very difficult task. Um, there are lots of risks. It's highly regulated and um, there, it's a real challenge and that's why you really haven't seen it yet. In 2009, and um, there, it's a real challenge and that's why you really haven't seen it yet. In 2009, which is the last year we have data for, pharmaceutical companies spent four point... In 2009, which is the last year we have data for, pharmaceutical companies spent 4.5 billion marketing to consumers. Of that 4.5 billion, they spent 2% online. So they are not in the... Of that 4.5 billion, they spent 2% online. So they are not in the conversation yet. This is what uh, the world of pharmaceutical market. So they are not in the conversation yet. This is what uh, the world of pharmaceutical marketing looks like today in the consumer interface, primarily. Uh, the world of pharmaceutical marketing looks like today in the consumer interface, primarily. When you're living with bipolar depression, it's easy to feel like you're fading into the background. When you're living with bipolar depression, it's easy to feel like you're fading into the background. That's because bipolar depression doesn't just affect you, it can consume you. You to feel like you're fading into the background. That's because bipolar depression doesn't just affect you, it can consume you. One option proven effective to treat bipolar depression is Seroquel XR. For many, it's one pill once a day. One option proven effective to treat bipolar depression is Seroquel XR. For many, it's one pill once a day. Here is some important safety information you should be aware of. Call your doctor if you have unusual changes. It's one pill once a day. Here is some important safety information you should be aware of. Call your doctor if you have unusual changes in mood, behavior, or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Elderly dementia patients taking Seroquel XR have an increased risk of death. Call your doctor if you have these in children, teens, and young adults. Elderly dementia patients taking Seroquel XR have an increased risk of death. Call your doctor if you develop fever, stiff muscles, and confusion. As these may be signs of a life-threatening reaction, or if you have uncontrollable muscle movements, as these could become permanent. High blood sugar has been reported with Seroquel XR in medicines like it, and in extreme cases can lead to coma or death. 
Tell your doctor if you have a history of low white blood cell ported with Seroquel XR and medicines like it, and in extreme cases can lead to coma or death. Tell your doctor if you have a history of low white blood cell count or seizures. Your doctor should check for cataracts. Other risks include increased cholesterol and triglycerides, weight gain, dizziness on standing, drowsiness, impaired judgment, and trouble swallowing. Use caution before driving or operating machinery. Learn more about bipolar depression and questions to ask your doctor at Sement and Trouble Swallowing. Use caution before driving or operating machinery. Learn more about bipolar depression and questions to ask your doctor at SaraquelXR.com. Bipolar depression doesn't have to consume you. Take the step today and ask your doctor whether Seroquel XR is right for you. If you can't, it doesn't have to consume you. Take the step today and ask your doctor whether Seroquel XR is right for you. If you can't afford your medication, AstraZeneca may be able to help. Okay, well, for you. If you can't afford your medication, AstraZeneca may be able to help. Okay, well, if you weren't depressed before you saw that. Um, so that's what advertising is today to consumers. And it's, it's necessary. Um, so that's what advertising is today to consumers. And it's, it's necessary uh, for reasons that I'm going to go into, but it's not that. And it's, it's necessary. Uh, for reasons that I'm going to go into, but it's not that compelling. Um, that ad that you just saw won, but it's not that compelling. Um, that ad that you just saw won a Clio, won an advertising award for being one of the very best ad that you just saw won a Clio, won an advertising award for being one of the very best pieces of uh, prescription drug advertising in 2010. One of the very best pieces of uh, prescription drug advertising in 2010. Um, so that says a lot about advertising. That commercial in 2010. Um, so that says a lot about advertising. That commercial had 37 minutes of product benefit and 50, or 37 seconds. That commercial had 37 minutes of product benefit and 50, or 37 seconds of product benefit and 50 seconds of warnings. And 50 or 37 seconds of product benefit and 50 seconds of warnings. Um, so, why would you do that? Why would you spend that money to advertise that product? There are two main reasons that pharmaceutical companies advertise. Why would you spend that money to advertise that product? There are two main reasons that pharmaceutical companies advertise. Uh, to consumers that are pretty accepted in the common wisdom. One is that pharmaceutical companies advertise uh, to consumers that are pretty accepted in the common wisdom. One is that if a, the studies show that if a consumer asks for a drug by name, the doctor is more likely to prescribe it in the common wisdom. One is that if a, the studies show that if a consumer asks for a drug by name, the doctor is more likely to prescribe it. Obviously, these things sell. Uh, the second is that it helps people doctor is more likely to prescribe it. Obviously, these things sell. Uh, the second is that it helps people identify and think about diseases. And this has led to a problem. The second is that it helps people identify and think about diseases. And this has led to a problem um, that's been identified in the literature as the worried well where um, cons led to a problem um, that's been identified in the literature as the worried well, where um, consumers in the United States look at a commercial and decide that, oh, I can use that. I where um, consumers in the United States look at a commercial and decide that, oh, I can use that. I need that, which drives up health care costs. Um, and if doctors are willing to prescribe it, 
um, it it just adds to um, and if doctors are willing to prescribe it um, it it just adds to unnecessary risk portfolios in fact when the commercial describes the risk or just adds to unnecessary risk portfolios in fact when the commercial describes the risk or describes the symptoms it tells the patient exactly what they need to say to fit the commercial describes the risk or describes the symptoms it tells the patient exactly what they need to say to fit the profile to be prescribed the drug. I don't think, I mean, I'm sure that's not intentional, but that is one of the results of prescription drug advertising is um, people that may not necessarily add. It's not intentional, but that is one of the results of prescription drug advertising is um, people that may not necessarily absolutely need the drug do ask for them. Okay, so that's where we, people that may not necessarily absolutely need the drug do ask for them. Okay, so that's where we are today. Very highly regulated, highly scripted, one-way communication. Okay, so that's where we are today. Very highly regulated, highly scripted, one-way communication that is designed to appeal to a consumer insight and motivate the consumer to ask for the product. Okay, um, where are we? And motivate the consumer to ask for the product, okay? Um, where are we going? This is where the rest of the world is going. The, um, this is where the rest of the world is going. The, um, the, the sites and the tools represented here are, are just a, a drop in the ocean, and the world is changing extremely quickly. In 19 tools represented here are, are just a, a drop in the ocean, and the world is changing extremely quickly. In 1996, the FDA first held a public hearing. Um, only. In 1996, the FDA first held a public hearing um, on how to regulate advertising on the internet for drugs, for prescription drugs, um, on how to regulate advertising on the internet for drugs, for prescription drugs. In um, 1999, they gave up and said, well, we're never going to have an opportunity. We're, we'll never be able to get these regulations done. Things are changing too fast. We'll take up and said, we're never going to have an opportunity. We'll, we'll never be able to get these regulations done. Things are changing too fast. We'll take everything on a case-by-case -case basis. In 2009, they again held public hearings to um, discuss how pharmaceutical pharmacy. In 2009, they again held public hearings to um, discuss how pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies should market on the internet and again since that time discuss how pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies should market on the internet and again since that time they haven't yet published any regulations they were and since that time they haven't yet published any regulations they were supposed to have done that in 2010 they've now made a statement that something the regulations they were supposed to have done that in 2010 they've now made a statement that something will come out hopefully by the end of this quarter which will be a draft and made a statement that something will come out hopefully by the end of this quarter which will be a draft and ps between the time the original regulation started, the original uh, hearing took place, and today, there are new tools, new approaches that the original uh, hearing took place, and today, there are new tools, new approaches that were not considered at the time of the hearing. So it's a very fluid situation, and new approaches that 
were not considered at the time of the hearing. So it's a very fluid situation, and the FDA's ability to regulate it is a um, very, very fluid situation, and the FDA's ability to regulate it is um, very, very compromised. So when we talk about social media for a pharmaceutical company, I'm not talking about banner ads. I'm not talking about company websites. We talk about social media for a pharmaceutical company. I'm not talking about banner ads. I'm not talking about company websites. I'm talking about social interaction, third party, user generated um, conversations. How does, pharmaceutical, how does a drug, a pharma brand, become relevant in that space? Where, quite frankly, there isn't a lot of a drug, a pharma brand, become relevant in that space where, quite frankly, there isn't a lot of trust. And there particularly isn't a lot of trust regarding pharmaceutical brands. So why? So why should they make the switch from TV to social media? I mean, I think this is pretty obvious. Um, this is a Wordle from, does everybody, you guys use Wordles. Right? I think this is pretty obvious. Um, this is a Wordle from, does everybody, you guys use Wordles, right? Familiar with Wordles? It's a really neat website, wordle.com, where you can put in um, a, a block of text or a paper or a study. Website, wordle.com where you can put in um, a, a block of text or a paper or a study, and it will generate the most important words or the words that are used the most often in the most important paper or a study, and it will generate the most important words or the words that are used the most often in the most important places into um, a design like this. So this is a wordle from words that are used the most often in the most important places into um, a design like this. So this is a wordle from a University of Maryland um, study called A Day Without Media, where college students were asked to, college students who participated had to spend a day without textia, where college students were asked to, college students who participated had to spend a day without text, without cell phones, computers, iPods, um, television, uh, no media of any kind. And then they had to write about it the next day. And the next day, um, television, uh, no media of any kind. And then they had to write about it the next day. And the next day when they wrote about it, um, the students filled, they blogged it. They had to write about it the next day. And the next day when they wrote about it, um, the students filled, they blogged about it. Um, and I think they generated 110,000 words. They blogged about it, um, and I think they generated 110,000 words, which was more than a 400-page novel. And they talked about, in terms of addiction, about um, how they couldn't function and how they became anxious. And so there was some, about, in terms of addiction, about um, how they couldn't function and how they became anxious, and so there was some, so, so it was a really interesting study. But one of the things the study showed was that, um, just, and so there was some, so, so it was a really interesting study. But one of the things the study showed was that um, most of the students that took the study, that were participating in the study, did not get their information. was that um, most of the students that took the study that were participated in the study did not get their information from any um, source or outlet that any professional news source. They got their news from their peers. Source or outlet that any professional news source. They got their news from their peers. And while that's fine for college students, Another study recently in 2007 showed that 70% of consumers 
believe their peers when it comes to health information, whether or not their peers. A study recently in 2007 showed that 70% of consumers believe their peers when it comes to health information, whether or not their peers have any medical training at all. So that's not um, an isolated circumstance. So the first thing you have with social media is it's believable. User-generated content is believable. Social media is it's believable. User-generated content is believable. The second thing is that it is an amazing resource for people who have medical questions. 60 million people resource for people who have medical questions. 60 million people last year looked up health information on the internet. And research 60 million people last year looked up health information on the internet. And research shows that that is going to grow exponentially every year. And research shows that that is going to grow exponentially every year. The internet is a great place to go for communities. Um, I've put some here, depression understood, there's an Alzheimer's chat community, cancer care, children with autism, HIV AIDS. I'm gonna take you to children with diabetes. Um, I've put some here, depression understood, there's an Alzheimer's chat community, cancer care, children with autism, HIV AIDS. I'm gonna take you to children's care, children with autism, HIV AIDS. I'm gonna take you to children with diabetes where you can join to children with diabetes where you can join a chat room You can join a chat room. And, you know, and discuss issues. This is not unusual. This is, um, this is not unusual. This is, um, this is a vital part of the patient's approach to whatever health care. This is a vital part of the patient's approach to whatever health care problem they have. And it's an ideal place to interact with the patient in an area approach to whatever health care problem they have. And it's an ideal place to interact with the patient in an area, in a place where they can feel um, safe. And you can get amazing information with the patient in an area, in a place where they can feel um, safe. And you can get amazing information from these, these places. And you cannot underestimate that. And you can get amazing information from these, these places. And you cannot underestimate the value of one-on-one -on -one conversation as opposed to that commercial we saw earlier in the evening. And you cannot underestimate the value of one-on-one -on -one conversation as opposed to that commercial we saw earlier in the evening. So why are they sitting on the sidelines? What's holding um, the commercial we saw earlier in the evening? So why are they sitting on the sidelines? What's holding um, Big Pharma back? from taking a, its place in this space? There are three reasons. What's holding um, Big Pharma back from taking a, its place in this space? There are three reasons. I'm gonna go through them tonight. Regulatory concerns, liability risks, and change, or the uh, difficulty risks, and change, or the uh, difficulty 
large companies have with change. Okay, regular uh, difficulty large companies have with change. Okay, regulatory concerns. There are three major ones. The first, and these are based on, okay, regulatory concerns. There are three major ones. The first, and these are based on um, FDA regulations and the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The first is that um, all advertisements have to be balanced with the Drug and Cosmetic Act. The first is that um, all advertisements have to be balanced, which means if you talk about the benefits, you have to talk about the risks. The second is off-label advertisements have to be balanced, which means if you talk about the benefits, you have to talk about the risks. The second is off-label claims, which I'll explain, and measuring and collecting adverse events. The second is off-label claims, which I'll explain, and measuring and collecting adverse events. So an example of a problem with balance is this following example. Tisigna is a medication used to treat a, treat a type of leukemia. Uh, Tisigna is a medication used to treat a, treat a type of leukemia. Um, it had on its website, Novartis had on its website, a share widget, which if you click on the share widget on Facebook, it would go to your Facebook's website, a share widget, which if you click on the share widget, on Facebook, it would go to your Facebook page. And if you're someone who is fighting cancer or someone in your family or a close friend, this might be something that you would want to share with your friends. That this is what I'm on, or someone in your family or a close friend, this might be something that you would want to share with your friends. That this is what I'm on or this is what, you know, they say you should take. I mean, this is this is important information. So when you clicked on the share widget, this is, this is important information. So when you clicked on the share widget, this is what um, showed up. This, this, this text I have here is what showed up on your Facebook page. The FDA, um, this, this text I have here is what showed up on your Facebook page. The FDA um, issued a warning letter for this because this talks about, the FDA um, issued a warning letter for this because this talks about what Tisigna does, which is treats leukemia, but it doesn't talk about the risk. This talks about what Tisigna does, which is treats leukemia, but it doesn't talk about the risk. So under current FDA guidance, this is not allowed because it doesn't, contain, it doesn't talk about risk, which means that share widgets are, off, are impossible to use. Because if, you, if you're going to talk about risk on a share widget, that share widgets are, off, are impossible to use. Because if, you, if you're going to talk about risk on a share widget, it is no longer a little blurb on your Facebook page you know, it's going to be a small, small chapter on your Facebook page. Facebook page, you know, it's going to be a small, small chapter on your Facebook page. So it makes it completely, it makes it impractical. That's an example where the balance rule limits your ability to share or communicate quickly when you have, when you don't have a lot of time. Um, so tweeting or communicate quickly when you have when you don't have a lot of time. Um, so tweeting would be another area where if you mention a drug, um, you probably wouldn't be able to do the the warnings. Um, in fact, you probably wouldn't be able to do the the warnings. Um, in fact. 
some companies tried to get around this by um, saying, for warning, see here with a, with a hot link. And FDA also said that was not appropriate. They called that the one-click rule, and that's no longer available. Okay, so that's appropriate. They called that the one-click rule, and that's no longer available. Okay, so that's the first, the first problem. The second problem, which is much more significant, the first one is something that one way or another we'll find a way to work around. The second one is much more significant. Off-label, Kent. The first one is something that one way or another we'll find a way to work around. The second one is much more significant. Off-label marketing. I want to make the first point, which is that off-label prescribing is completely legal. It is necessary and it's an important part of the practice of medicine. Um, once a drug is approved for a certain use, a doctor is free to use that drug for any important part of the practice of medicine. Um, once a drug is approved for a certain use, a doctor is free to use that drug for any, any other use in their judgment should be used. Um, Off-label marketing is not legal. Even if the um, off-label marketing is not legal, even if the information is truthful. So, an example would be Abilify. Abilify is a product that is used for Alzheimer's. An example would be Abilify. Abilify is a product that is used for Alzheimer's patients. And there is data to suggest that it is helpful and that it is not hurt, is used for Alzheimer's patients. And there is data to suggest that it is helpful and that it is not hurtful, or not un unnecessarily hurtful, um, but helpful, and that it is not hurtful, or not un unnecessarily hurtful. Um, but the, the maker of Abilify, Bristol-Myers, cannot talk about Abilify with respect to Alzheimer's. So if they are on a, say, depression page and chatting about Abilify with respect to Alzheimer's, so if they are on a, say, depression page and chatting about, you know, well,